Welcome to You Can't Get There From Here, Volume 2, a limited audio series from Toronto's Factory Theatre featuring five commissioned audio theatrical works from some of Canada's most creative playwrights. My name is Nina Liakino, and I am the Artistic Director of Factory Theatre. In this episode, we are thrilled to present the world premiere of Doubletree by award-winning playwrights Émilie Lavoie and Omari Newton, directed by Mike Payette and featuring the vocal talents of Chela Hunter, Andrew Kushner, and Andre Sills. This audio drama is set in Takaranto, and it stands on land under the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, a treaty between the Haudenosaunee, the Windat, and the Anishinaabe, which includes the Mississaugas of the Credit, that bounds them to share the territory and protect the land. All Indigenous nations and settlers alike are invited to live by these treaties' terms in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Today, the meeting place of Takaranto is still home to many Indigenous people across Turtle Island. Factory would like to acknowledge with gratitude all the storytellers, stewards, and caretakers, recorded and unrecorded, on whose territory we are able to live and thrive. We'd like to encourage all our listeners to take some time to learn about the treaties that exist where you live or are listening from today. You can find more information at www.whose.land. Whether you're listening from your home or taking a journey through your city, Thank you for tuning in and enjoy Double Tree. your emergency. Yes, hi. I heard a scream coming from the apartment upstairs. What address are you at? Elm Street. I own the cafe underneath the apartment. What's your phone number? 416-871-2253. And my name is Rachel. <gasps> is that the screaming you're referring to? Yes, you hear it? That's it. <laughs> Rachel, are you in a safe location? No, I, I'm, yes. I, I think so. I'm downstairs, but the doors are locked. <laughs> Do you know who lives in the apartment upstairs? <gasps> oh, my God. Please hurry, she's pregnant. Who's pregnant, Rachel? The woman upstairs. What's her name? I, I, I think her name is, uh, Tara? I, I don't know for sure. She moved in with her husband. His name is Sydney. He comes in a lot. Are you sending someone? I really think you should be sending someone. November 15th, 2019. It was a Friday night. The temperature dipped well into the minuses, deterring Torontonians from going out and celebrating the end of a long work week. Even restaurants gave up and closed early. But not everything was quiet that night. Just stay on the phone with me, please. When did the screaming start? Uh, I was closing up my shop for the night. I heard voices at first, just singing and arguing. I I, I don't know. It sounded like a black um, African-American voices to maybe three different men. Oh, God, please. Hurry. The police are on the way. Just stay on with me until they get there, okay? Rachel? Rachel, are you there? The 911 call was dropped. Rachel and the operator claimed that neither of them hung up the phone. Police showed up quickly, and what they found in that apartment rattled even the most senior officer. It was a gruesome, tragic scene, one that captivated the people of Toronto and made international headlines. I'm Dom Maxwell, and this is Tremors in T.O., Episode 6. Insert title here once I figure it out. For those of you who don't know the Sydney and Tara officer story, let me fill you in. A little over three years ago, the Vancouver-based couple were expecting a baby when they found themselves at the receiving end of an unexpected gift, an inherited apartment on Elm Street in Toronto. 
They jumped at the chance to own a place and get off the rental treadmill, not wanting to live paycheck to paycheck anymore. Well, I stopped the tape. What? You don't like it? Is something wrong? I was on track for tenure. I had a good job. We weren't living paycheck to paycheck. We were living in Vancouver. Same difference. <laughs> right? I'm a UBC grad. This is not some black thug from the hood poverty porn. Change it. Sure. I get it. I will change it. No problem. Like I said on the phone, I'm trying to amplify your version of the story. I want to it's get this right. It's not my version. I'm telling you what happened. Yes. No, totally. I'm committed to being 100% objective on this. <clears throat> Sorry. Sometimes the tape player sticks. Who uses cassette tapes? I'm old school. <laughs> I really like that analog, gritty style. Plus, I didn't want my laptop or phone to get stolen. Stolen by who? Watch those hands, Sydney. Just showing off the fine craftsmanship of these cuffs, sir. I'm sorry. I know the handcuffs are technically for my safety, but I did tell them. You know, I said they didn't need to go to the trouble. Fine. Let's just keep going. It all seemed so perfect. New baby. New home. New start. Until... You have the wrong black man. It wasn't me. I know I sound crazy, but they were there the whole time. The two black men. Didn't you see them? That was Sydney Officer addressing the press as he left his 2019 murder trial. That's right. Fast forward six months from the time Tara got the call about inheriting the Elm Street apartment. Tara's dead. Horrifically murdered. Her stillborn baby tossed in the wastebasket by her side. And Sydney is the prime suspect. The recorded outburst you just heard was not an isolated incident. Court tapes document what the prosecutor called prolonged delusions. Sidney believed that there were two black jury members and that they killed his wife. In actuality, the jury members were all white. The prosecution thought that he was angling for an insanity plea because the evidence against him was so overwhelming. Except for that 911 call. The cafe owner who called from downstairs also said she heard multiple voices. In fact, she specified that they sounded African-American. I asked... Hold up. What does African-American sound like? Like me? Do I sound African-American? No. I mean, yes, you do. Because you are one. Well, not one. <laughs> like, you're, you're, you're not some kind of other... Uh, <sighs> look, I, I, I'm just quoting her statement. Her witness statement described a, uh, well, I don't want to say that word, but a blank spiritual being sung. Uh, you, you know what I'm trying to say, right? She said it didn't feel of this time. A Negro spiritual. I heard it too. Sydney's lawyer, Carmela Brown, how influential that element of the 911 call was as a piece of evidence. Uh, the 911 call was great. Sure, it was something, but her claiming to hear multiple voices? It was a Friday night on Elm Street. I mean, that isn't exactly foolproof insight. Besides, it got messy when she brought up the singing stuff. She backtracked. She didn't really know what she was trying to describe, and it made her sound wishy-washy. So, yeah, like I said, it's not foolproof. You know what is foolproof? The fact that there was no evidence, no fingerprints, no human DNA, nada, to connect anyone else to the murder except, I'm sad to say, Sydney Officer. Do you think it was Sydney who murdered his wife? <laughs> what? Are you an idiot? You think I'm going to answer that on your little podcast? <sighs> I'm doing this as a favor for your aunt, so you better... Uh, shit. I have to edit that part out. I wondered how you convinced my lawyer to connect us. Yeah, <laughs> my aunt and your lawyer were sorority sisters. That explains how a guy wearing a plum-colored Kangol hat got through Carmella. You don't like my hat? Is it bad? <laughs> it's the same hat Ginger Greg, the rap and rehabilitation guy, wears. Well, I'm not ashamed of a little nepotism. It's how the world works, right? <laughs> That's what my wife said when we got our place. Right. Let's get back into this. 
What you're going to hear next are audio recordings taken from Tara's computer. The files were part of a diary project for their unborn baby. Deemed irrelevant by Sydney's lawyer, they were never played in court. The voices you're going to hear belong to Sydney and Tara. Put the phone down and get me out of here! Uh, okay, babe, I'm trying. Just relax. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh my god, it's really stuck. <laughs> it's not funny. Just get me out and, and stop filming. Okay, hold on. Uh, 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 oh, there we go. Wow, pregnancy strength is real. Okay, uh. God is my witness. I'm never going in this thing ever again. <laughs> Can I post this in the diary for the baby? So that if he or she is afraid of small spaces, he or she can never blame me? Hell no! <laughs> oh, I'm sorry that you got stuck in the elevator. I just wanted you to see it. Can you believe this place is an actual working freight elevator? Like, <sighs> what is our life right now? Yes, I can believe it. White people are extra. Well, white people gave us a free, spacious apartment, so... White people probably stole it from non-white people, so... Ah, so this gift from my family to us is reparations? They'll have to do better than an old-ass place with a busted elevator. The elevator worked fine for me. <coughs> white privilege. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I gotta get out of here. You, you hungry? Always. Because baby... Pick up some Italian. I'm going to explore our estate. Oh, did I show you what I found? Nope. Check it out. Ooh, a dish rag. <laughs> Very <laughs> funny. It's an old timey nighty. You know, I love me some old timey nighties. Those yellow stained frills are so hot, baby. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Want to do it in the elevator? Hell no! You won't even go in there for midday sex? <laughs> Jesus, you really are claustrophobic. And you really are going to make a great single mom. Oh! Wait, are you still recording? <laughs> <laughs> yeah! Christ. Can we board that thing up? No way. I love it. Hey. Sydney. Are you okay? Hey! What? What? You zoned out. Yeah, I just... Sorry. Where were we? The elevator. Right. Y you say you have really bad claustrophobia, but you seem okay in this room, and it's not exactly bright and spacious. I am claustrophobic, but that elevator was something else. Do you want to stop? No. Do you need to use the bathroom? Dumb. This isn't high school. I don't get to raise my hand to go potty. Let's keep going. Okay. Tara filmed as she explored the apartment. Mm -mm -mm. Empty. Mm -mm -mm. Empty. <gasps> Babe? You okay? Yeah. Sorry, I just... Whew. I found our first vermin. I'll get some traps later today. Uh, uh, it's okay. It's already dead. Tara started finding dead mice in the second bedroom. She blamed the mice on our cat, Tinker, but that wasn't true. Could be true. Cats like to hunt mice. <laughs> no, Tinker wouldn't go near the bedroom. The mice were rotten, like they'd died years before. Was this when you first noticed strange things happening in the apartment? No. It... It started with that nightgown. That disgusting nightgown. Tara started wearing it constantly. And then she'd get up in the middle of the night and go to the second bedroom, the one with the elevator... I tried to stay up and watch her, but she always managed to get out of bed without me noticing. And, and I'm a very light sleeper. It was like she floated out of bed. I'd find her sitting on the floor in front of the elevator with her head cocked to the side. 
She'd be staring at the rusted, grated doors, mouth open, making this sound. Sidney decided to record Tara through the baby monitor he bought and positioned it towards the elevator. He was hoping to pick up something on video that might explain what was going on. Here is some of that audio now. Tara? Tara? What? Baby? What are you doing in the elevator? Tara? I wanna go down. Baby, what's going on? Let me help you out. It's freezing. Come on. Ah! Sam! They touched me all over! That's where the audio glitches, and then there's nothing. It's totally compromised after that. What I never said at trial, or even to my lawyer, and what you couldn't really see because of how dark it was. Tara was completely naked. The nightdress was wrapped around her wrist, binding them together. She had her hands raised above her head, and she was swaying back and forth. So when the doors slammed shut, it wasn't her. It couldn't have been. That's right. The elevator dropped, so I turned to run downstairs, and... Tara was standing behind me, wearing her nightdress. She had this look on her face like she couldn't see me. I looked back at the elevator again, and the door was wide open. The elevator was empty. According to court documents citing Sydney, he begged her to leave Toronto with him, offering a hotel as a temporary solution until they sold the place. She refused. She threatened violence. The prosecution keyed in on this, leaning into the idea that Tara and Sydney were having such major marital problems that she had to lock herself in a separate room for her own safety. This was heavily contested by the defense, but we'll get back to that later. First, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Have you ever wanted the warmth of a blanket, but the functionality of pants and sweaters? You should try Swanker, the first blanket-sweater-pants hybrid. Really? Sorry. This project is way over budget. It's using considerable resources, you know? Called in a favor with my aunt, I maxed out my credit card. I hate doing sponsored ads, but the Swanker people offered me... Are we uh, done with Wanker? uh, It's Swanker, not Wank. Yes. Sorry. We're done. The prosecution didn't just rely on the deterioration of my relationship to build their case. They amplified my race to sway the jury. Can I quote you? No. You should say it. I say it and I'm playing the race card. Right. Okay. I'll add it. No problem. Keep going. So why would Sidney have killed his wife? This was a man that never had so much as a parking ticket in his 30-some-odd years of life. The couple had no history of therapy, public fights. Their text messages were clear of suspicion. Their friends' testimonies were a chorus of praise and sadness. Other than that strange 911 call, no drama or violence was ever associated with the couple until they inherited their place from Tara's great-aunt. The address had been in the family for generations, and there was a long history of freak incidents involving Tara's female relatives, all of whom had resided in the Elm Street apartment at one time or another. Obituaries and news clippings from the late 19th century onwards range from suicide, kidnappings, a heart attack, and car accidents. Most recently, Tara's great-aunt was institutionalized in 2018 before dying suddenly later that year. It wasn't so much that she left the place to Tara, more that Tara was the only family member left. Look, I want to be respectful of your wife's family, so I I I can leave that part out, if you like. No, keep it. Okay. Are you sure? Then I'll so win it. What do you mean by that? 
What? What did you mean by that? Nothing. Let's keep going. We can just sit here for a second. No, I don't want to sit here for a second. Okay. Because this next part is... It's sensitive stuff. I don't need your trigger warnings about my own life. Just play the goddamn tape. Hey, that's your warning. <sighs> Sorry, sir. Now, the next bit about Tara is admittedly shitty. I mean, the parts that the defense build a lot of their case around. I guess when the evidence is that strong against your client, you have no choice but to play dirty. So, remember that Tara was finally pregnant after years of trying. She and Sydney went to fertility clinics and burned through a lot of their money this way. But six months before the inheritance, she had a successful round. Sydney's lawyer claimed that because of Tara's difficulty in this area, she became anxious and obsessive, suffering mentally and physically. This backfired. Because medical records showed Tara's egg reserve was so low and Sydney's sperm count was high, the prosecution claimed that he resented the fact that they incurred a substantial amount of debt to have a child he inevitably didn't want. And that's what the jury ultimately believed. Tara's last ultrasound appointment was at a clinic in Vancouver. It confirmed that she was carrying a healthy fetus. Once she and Sydney moved into the apartment, Tara began talking about having twins. The talk then escalated. She started buying doubles of things like clothing, bottles, and toys. It was no longer the baby, but the babies. So was it a mother's premonition? Maybe. There certainly wasn't any proof that Tara was carrying more than one child. All of this left the prosecution with one central question. If things were so bad with Tara's mental health, why didn't Sydney reach out for help? If I'm going to be honest, that's kind of something I wonder about, too. Sure you do. There's a lot there to wonder about. It's just, you didn't tell anyone. Friends had no idea. Your family was unaware of any issue. You didn't contact local clinics or set up appointments for Tara in Toronto for the baby or her general health. Why? Who am I going to call, huh? Friends? I didn't have any friends in Toronto. And the ones in Vancouver were so put together and perfect, they wouldn't know what a problem is. My family couldn't deal with that shit either. So who? The cops? You want me to call 911 to say that my white, pregnant wife locked herself in the bedroom? Say that she smashed the dresser to make a second crib by hand? That she's babbling and screaming about two black baby boys named Tundi and Charles carving their names into the floors with their fingernails? Oh, and the bruises on her arms? Self-inflicted. The big old nasty negro didn't do nothing. Don't you worry about me. Don't be looking this way. These bad white folks always be telling tales on us. Always tattling. Getting us killed. That there white lady damn lie. Lie! Lying. They always be lying on us, getting us killed. I swear on my mama, I didn't touch that bitch. I didn't touch her. Him neither. You want to know what? She been touching on us. That's what. That's what these white devils do. They try to fuck you, then they fuck you. Sydney. Hey, you zoned out again. You were muttering something. I couldn't make out what you were saying. Yeah, uh, sorry. No, I'm sorry. I didn't realize your support system was strained. That must have been isolating and awful. You're fidgeting. Are you afraid of me? Honestly? Sometimes? <laughs> when you... Zone out? Yeah. I never used to be like that, you know? It's understandable, given... Everything. Really? Because I don't understand. Shortly after moving into that place, I started getting this ringing in my ears. Not all the time, but when it starts, it makes me feel so much hate. Just hate for no reason. Your lawyer described a progressive case of tinnitus brought on by stress. My lawyer is logical. That's a good segue, actually. To what? The night of the murder. Are you ready to get back in? I've never left. 
No one actually knows what happened before the police arrived at Sydney and Tara's apartment on the night of the murder. The baby monitor that was set up in the bedroom, the one Sydney used to capture Tara's episodes, suddenly stopped recording once he entered the room. What you're about to hear is what was captured before the footage cut out. Tara? I've got dinner. Tara? Hello? Tara? Baby, open the door. I'm sick of this shit! Open the door! Then it sounds like the door opens. Not by force. It seems to slowly swing open on its own, and that's when the footage cuts out. Is that right? Yes. Then what happened? The room was empty. Empty and eerily quiet, except for what sounded like wind. There was a breeze coming from the elevator shaft. I I could feel it on my ankles. I know I said I'd never go into that thing again, but I found myself moving towards it, as if I was being gently pushed from behind. Pushed? Yes. I got inside and closed the doors. It started to drop for what felt like ages. It picked up speed as it went, faster and faster. I thought it was going to crash, split open, but then it just stopped. The doors opened. And I was not in our apartment anymore. I was standing in a tunnel, or at least that's what it felt like. I couldn't really see anything. It was so dark, but I could still feel that breeze on my legs. I called for Tara. I yelled her name. That's when I heard it. Heard what? It was coming from all around me. There were thousands of them. Mice. They started piling into the elevator, falling from the ceiling even. The doors opened... The elevator went up and I was drowning. Do you think I'm crazy yet? Look, I've covered a lot of stories with supernatural occurrences. And mediums talk about portals existing in spaces in someone's home that are ignored or cluttered. Think closets and crawl spaces. Basically any space where energy can't flow freely. They say those spaces act as doorways for spiritual energy to pass through the home. And it's always dark energy. So, if I take that and I apply it to this, I mean a tunnel underneath a building with only a small elevator shaft to cycle energy? You're not crazy. Not to me. The elevator opened up in the second bedroom. That's when the mice emptied out, disappeared. But I could feel them on me, in me. That's when I saw Tara on the floor. She was in labor. One of the babies was outside of her. The other one was crowning. I saw its hands pushing through terror. The first one crawled underneath the bed. The second one followed. Remember that hate I was telling you about? Yes. It just came over me so strongly. I couldn't stop the feeling. So that's what you were feeling that night? I heard singing. You weren't alone. I bent over my wife and I took the nightdress that was folded neatly beside her head as if it was there for me and I strangled her with it. Then I heard myself start to sing as if the song was pushing me to do it, pushing me to strangle my wife, except I wanted to do it. It felt good to do it. She deserved it. Sydney. Did did, did I do it again? Yes. Yes. When the police came, and the lights from their guns were pointed at me, I snapped back into myself. The hate was gone. My wife was dead. My baby was... You know what? You you don't have to get into that part, if you don't want. She was in the wastebasket. I didn't put her there. It was stated that mice were eating your wife that she had been dead for days. She was decomposing, like the air was sucking her dry. Not our baby, though. Our baby was pink and perfect. 
she just wasn't alive. How do you explain something like that? I don't know. It seems no one could offer a credible explanation about that. Okay, folks, time's up. Sydney, let's go. Listen, I know we ran out of time, but I'll talk to Carmela about setting up another call. And I'll send you the final edit before I post it, okay? Sure thing. And hey, maybe you can use this for your appeal. There, there's a lot of new information in it. Appeal? What makes you think you'll want to do that? I never got a chance to send Sydney the final version. A few days after our visit, Sydney's lawyer called and told me he was found dead in his cell. They determined the cause of death was by asphyxiation. When the guard found Sidney, he swore he heard voices before he entered the cell. The confusing part here is that Sidney was in solitary confinement. When I asked Sidney's lawyer what would happen to the apartment, she said that because all of Tara's relatives, her entire family line, was essentially gone, the property would be relinquished back to the city and it would likely be demolished. Personally. I think that's a good thing, and I'll tell you why. My last bit of research on that apartment revealed something pretty horrific. Tara's great-great-grandmother, who lived at that same address, accused two black men of groping her outside of church. Those men were hung on two big trees at the top of a hill that looked down on the St. John's Ward. They were left there so long that their feet were eaten by mice before their families could cut them down. Now this part. This part keeps me up at night. The names of those men were carved into the trees. Tundi and Charles. I'm Dom Maxwell, and this is Tremors in T.O. Episode 6. Double Tree. For tuning in. For more information on this audio drama, please visit the show notes or find us on social media. If you loved what you just listened to, please share it. Leave us a review or screenshot today's episode and post it on your social media channels with the hashtag you can't get there from here. And if you'd like to lend even more support to our audio drama series, Consider making a donation in support of our free virtual programming so that we can continue to offer this vital access to arts and culture for audiences across Canada. All donations are 100% tax deductible and go directly to paying the artists and tradespeople who made this episode possible. To donate, visit factorytheater.ca slash donate. If you haven't already... We hope you'll check out all the other audio dramas in Volume 2 of You Can't Get There From Here. Thank you for joining us. (laughs) ¶¶